Well, folks, it's wonderful to be back with you at this particular place and to talk today about your questions and hopefully some honest answers. You call from all over America and you left your voicemail questions. Today, we're going to hear your voices on the air and uh, I will do my best to answer. So Wendy's here with us, the lovely lady, and she's just back from the Ukraine. She's been in the war zone, <laughs> Wendy. It wasn't the same without you, because yeah. you and I were in the war zone in, in Israel yeah, one time. Right. But, um, if, if the smell of cordain is there, it's no fun. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good to be back. All Great right, to have Pat to with here. us yes, today. And we've got a question. We're going to start with Patricia. She's from Hawthorne, California. Go ahead. My question is, uh, can people get saved when they're on their deathbed and go to heaven? Because I'm confused there, because in that case, we could all just sin our whole lives and then just get saved when we're ready to die. Could you please clear up that confusion for me? Thank you, Pat. Well, the thing of it is, you never know when you're going to die. So if you decide you want to spend your life sinning, uh, death may come sooner than you thought. But you remember the thief on the cross, he said to Jesus, he said, remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, this day you will be with me in paradise. So the answer is, he didn't say, have you said the sinner's prayer? Do you go to church? Have you done this? He said, this day, because it was a confession of faith in Christ. And yes, you can make it on your deathbed, but I wouldn't presume on saying, well, I'll, I'll sin boldly that grace may abound. You know, you don't even think of that. Yeah, good advice. All right, thanks, Pat. Phyllis from Cincinnati, Ohio, has this question for Pat. I was calling to ask a question about retirement savings and investing. A Christian's perspective on that, and is that important, or are we being too worldly when we think that way? I don't think there's anything... Oh, of course, worldly. I, I think we're all supposed to manage our affairs properly. And I think we should uh, invest for the retirement. And there's nothing in the world wrong with that. Uh, you know, the, the, we, we uh, uh, I, I believe in, in the stock market. I believe in investing. And I, I think that we should be intelligent with our, uh, our money. Um, you know, we, we're stewards. And uh, we're stewards of, the, of our life, we're stewards of what we do, and we're stewards of who we are. So uh, you are a steward. And uh, you remember Jesus said, well, you render to Caesar what's Caesar, you render to God what's God. Well, I mean, for example, giving, you've got to have some money to give. The more you get, the more you can give away. And that's what I think. And I think God says, look, if you prove me with tithes and offerings, you, you read Malachi, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you such a blessing you can't contain. Well, what, is the, what do you do with that blessing? Well, you can give more away. That's the way I think. Okay. That's right. Okay. Amen. <laughs> Good right. Uh, an interesting question from a viewer in Norfolk, Virginia. Hello, Pat. I like to think that we live at a pretty good time in history. If you could choose any other time throughout history, when would you want to live? You know something? I, I think this is as good a time as we could possibly have had. Can you imagine? I, I was thinking today as um, I, I was eating, <laughs> I ate oatmeal for breakfast, and I'm thinking, we live in a world of plenty. We have warm clothes. We have uh, beautiful um, uh, food. We have the, the abundance of food at the grocery store, what you can get. And uh, we, we have freedom in America. I, I really think, you know, heaven is going to be wonderful. But I do think that he's, he's given us a right nice world to live in right now. And I, I don't think, you know, if I lived at the time of Jesus, I wouldn't have believed in him. And he was an itinerant preacher, and, you know, I, I wouldn't have believed in him. So many, only a few did, and uh, they had to wait to see the fulfillment of prophecy even then. So what time? I believe this is as good a time in this country as you could possibly have. And I'm very grateful that I was born, as, as uh, was said, I, I won the ovarian lottery. <laughs> I, I, I could have been born in India to a poor family. 
you know. That's right. And God says he appoints the times and the seasons. Uh, uh, exactly. That we're to live. Exactly. And so we're all supposed to be here for this time. <laughs> Although, you know, I love the fashion in the 40s. Yeah. So if I could go back, fashion-wise, I go back well, to the 40s. Well, I, I don't care about fashions. <laughs> I care about life and, and health. I mean, we've had so many breakthroughs in health care and everything. I mean, this has been a wonderful time to live. All right. Amen. <laughs> Beverly from Kenner, uh, Louisiana, has this question. Hello, Pat. My question for you today is, I understand loving unconditionally and to love your neighbor as yourself, but how do you love a family that is very toxic and still glorify God? What boundaries do I have and still walk in the Christian values? Thank you, Pat. I, I think you can love them yourself if they've hurt you. If you have all against any, you forgive them. But you don't have to be in the presence of somebody that's toxic. Uh, you know, the Apostle Paul says you don't even have to eat with certain kind of people. And uh, I, I think if somebody's a Christian, for example, but um, uh, you don't have to expose yourself to people who are unpleasant, who are, you know, they'll, they'll tear you down always. You know, the, you get in the presence of a negative thinking, well, this is terrible. I feel so bad. Isn't the weather awful? I, I, you know, isn't the government terrible? They're all a bunch of crooks. You, you don't want to listen to that junk. So you're better to, it, it's like, would you want to take a garbage can and pour it on your head every morning? The answer is no. So you don't have to be around them. So uh, the fact that they're there in the neighborhood, just, just avoid them. You can go someplace. Else. There are lots of people in America and around the world, there are about 7 billion people, so surely you can find companions that are, quote, not toxic. Yes. Right. Love them from a distance. Hey, love them from a distance. Right. Here's Lou from New York City. Hi, Pat. My name is Lou. Is it okay for a Christian to play lotto and play flesh game for money, being that it's legal? Well, I'm... You know, the question about money is, uh, are you depending on, for example, uh, are you praying? You know, before I came to the Lord, I, I played poker. And I mean, I'd sit there praying to pull to an inside straight or to get a heart to have a flush. Did you ever get one? Uh, I mean, <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes no. But I mean, you know, if you put all your money out and, and you're gambling, that, that way is so destructive. But, uh, you know, and I also think it's a wrong way to finance a country or a state with having legal gambling and all these uh, uh, get-rich-quick schemes. I think the best way to achieve money is little by increase the law of use, exponential curve. If you do that, there'll be plenty of money. But I, I think, well, playing the games, I mean, if... If you want to take $5 and put it out in a thing like that and don't worry about it, I mean, I can't say that's a sin. It's, that's your business. But if you begin to pray and, 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 and let that be the source of your income, it is such utter foolishness. Mm, yeah, good advice. Lynn from Clarion, Pennsylvania has this question for Pat. My name is Lynn, and I'm from rural Pennsylvania. We have a bunch of rural churches in our area that have anywhere from 15 to 100 people in their congregation, and it seems like people are not wanting to come into the church buildings. My question is, what are some ideas on how to take our church out of the community that you might have for us? I, I think, you know, one of the biggest churches, I think, uh, was out there in Arizona uh, where the pastor uh, rented some buses and he went out uh, in the neighborhood to bring the kids to Sunday school. And you know, a lot of people w may not want to go to church, but they love to have their children go to church. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a bus in, in the church and you say, I'll pick up your children at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning, and the next thing you know, mom and dad will follow. And I, I think that, that, that that's how uh, one pastor in Phoenix grew to one of the biggest churches in America by having a uh, a fleet of buses. I got some old buses, and they were out picking up people. That's very creative. It yeah, be, well, it worked. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Tell me more on that. Okay. Tell me more on that. Okay. Well, here's Cindy from Louisville, Kentucky. My question is concerning the Ark of the Covenant. 
Do you think it's still out there? Will it ever be found? Or has it been lost forever? Thank you. <laughs> it, it, it made uh, uh, Steven Spielberg a pretty good movie in search of the, the missing Ark of the Covenant. Uh, I, I think it's long gone. I, I don't think there's any hidden Ark, but it, it did make an interesting movie, and that's where you've got In Search of the Lost Ark. Mm -hmm. It sure was a good one. Okay, this uh, question from a viewer in Flagstaff, Arizona. Yes, my question for Pat is on the second coming of the Lord. On the one side, the word says Jesus is coming back as a thief in the night. On the other side, Jesus is coming back, and the whole world will see him when he descends from heaven onto the Mount of Olives. I'm a little confused. On the one hand, a thief. On the other hand, everybody will see him. Pat, could you explain the differences in the two uh, statements I just mentioned? Thank you so much. Appreciate the show. You, I think the idea of a thief in the night means, you know, you're sleeping and you're not paying attention and all of a sudden this thief comes and you weren't expecting him. I think that's the concept is that he's going to come at a time when we're not really awaiting him and the, the, the world is not going to expect Jesus to come back again. But in terms of when he does come, uh, he will come with a shout of command, with the voice of the ark of Abel, the trump of God, and it's going to be a big, big deal. It's not going to be quiet. It's going to be a big one. He will descend from heaven uh, with the trumpet of God. But uh, the thief in the night idea is that uh, it's going to be unexpected. Even for believers, will we have a sense of the time that we Well, the, 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 Paul said he won't come upon you unawares because we are expecting, we know the scriptures, and we, we, but the world doesn't know the scriptures. And so the world, you know, in the days of Noah, they were spending their time with all kinds of marriage and giving in marriage and having parties and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And then he said the flood came and swept them all away. That's the unexpected part of it. Gotcha. Interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. Judy from Chico, California has this question for Pat. My question is, who are the crowds of witnesses in the book of Hebrews? That's my question. Hope I can get an answer. Thank you so much. The, the cloud of witnesses are those who have gone before, who have known the Lord. And he, he, he lists some of the champions of the faith who have, they're, they're kind of like the witnesses that have lived before us. And uh, they give an example and so when we read the Bible, we read about these champions of the faith, one after the other, that uh, are in these uh, uh, wonderful uh, experiences with God. Here's an interesting question from Vincent. He's from Washington, Pennsylvania. My question is, what has been the greatest battle that the ministry, the 700 Club, has had? I think, I think the, the biggest one was getting started. I mean, you know... We st I started this thing with $70. I had a U-Haul trailer, uh, four kids, and no money. And I think we were up against it uh, month after month after month. We didn't have enough money to do anything. And we were just crying, uh, dependent on God for His mercy. That was the big struggle. Once you kind of get to the point where you're you're up and moving, it's not near as hard. You run into all kinds of difficulties along the way, but nothing as big as, as just being started. I mean, that was the struggle. You kind of you, you begin to reach out to, to get the strength you need and the people you need to do the job. And once we had that, then things got a, little, a whole lot easier. But in the old days, I, we had one person and I was it. And we, I kept the books and I did everything and, uh, you know, I had to believe God, and it was touch and go week after week after week until after the Lord began to really move, and we, we saw his hand of blessing. And if you want the full story, you need to get Shout It, Pat's book, Shout It from the Housetop, and his latest book, I Walk with a Living God. Yes. Both have all the details, and it is you, you won't be able to put it down, Vincent. So if you want the full story, Thank those you. two books. Thank you. Right. Okay, Rachel from Oxford, Ohio, has this question for Pat. 
Hi, my name's Rachel, and I've wondered for a long time, did they really find Noah's Ark in Turkey there at Mount Ararat, or it's really not true? Thank you. Oh, I had a guy give me a hunk of wood that he says was from Noah's Ark. They claim they found it, but it's in an, an ice flow, and I don't know if it's up there. He, he, it was, it was, it settled on the Mount Ararat, and uh, there are many, many uh, expeditions that have gone to look for the ark, but uh, to my knowledge, nobody's ever found it. It'd be a wonderful thing if they did, but uh, I, I, don't, I think most of it is is, uh, is uh, fiction. And as I say, somebody brought me a hunk of wood. He said, that's from the ark. <laughs> well, it'd be a good hike up the mountain, yeah, at least. A big hike, yeah. So. yeah. But the Turks, I don't think, will let people go in there and that's against the law. All right. Your questions, voicemail questions, and Pat's honest answers. And we're going to start with Ronald. He's from Los Angeles, California. Go ahead. I have a question for you. I have heard it said, once saved, always saved. Is that true? Even though we are saved, we oftentimes fall back into our sinful ways. Can we lose our saved status? And if we do, can we repent and ask for forgiveness again? Or it doesn't matter. Once saved, always saved. Ronald, uh, you've asked some very good questions, but there are several questions. The answer is the Bible never says once saved and always saved. It always says fear to fall. It's like riding a bicycle. You can't say, well, I know how to ride a bicycle so I don't have to pump the pedals. You have to continue in the way. If you continue in the way, we are, he, he, as we walk in the light, as he in the, is in the light, the blood of Christ continuously cleanses us from all sin. But it's, as we walk in the light, there is no way we can say, well, I'm once saved, always saved, and I can live any way I want to because I'm going to go to heaven. I think that is very dangerous, and the Bible never says anything like it. But it says, they went out from us, which is an evident token they weren't part of us. But he said, I, I, I think better things of you, brothers. So there's nothing in there that says somebody who found the Lord has actually fallen away from him. But they said, if you do, it's impossible to bring you back to repentance. But I think if somebody has sinned, look at David. You, you read the Psalms. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. And, you know, there's no question. I mean, he committed adultery, and then he had a man murdered, and God forgave him. So I do think you can be forgiven. And that's the big thing is to be cleansed and come back to the, the fullness of God's spirit. But I think every day we have to ask God his blessing. I, I need to ask God every day I want more of your anointing. God, I want, to, I want to do what you want to do every day. It isn't like I've been saved once and I can live any way I want to. No way, no how. You know, and once you know the truth and once, you've, uh, once you're saved, sin's not that fun anymore. Well, you know? <laughs> exactly. well that's, that's yeah. right. Because you yeah. know you, what you're yeah. doing is wrong. Yeah. So it, it, okay. anyway, Linda from Denver, Colorado. Who are the two witnesses in the book of Revelation? And do you think we are in which seal? Which seal has opened up? Thank you very much. Linda, I, I don't know which seal is opened up. I really don't. I do think that uh, there's something in there, but I saw an angel having a fiery mountain, and I do think that speaks of some kind of an asteroid hit on the Earth, and that will open up something. But who are the witnesses? I think it has to do with the law and the prophets. So you've got uh, Moses on the one hand, you've got Elijah on the other hand uh, as, as the two witnesses. If not them, it could be somebody else representing the prophets. And there are many prophets, but I, I think the idea is you've got the, the unified Bible, the law on the one hand, the prophets on the other. That's who they are. Amen. Cindy from New Orleans has this question for Pat. Hi, Pat. My name is Cindy, and I have a question about angels. My daughter gave me a little music box, and it has little angels in it. I don't worship the angels, but someone told me that I should throw out all my angels. I don't worship them. I don't idolize the little music box. What do you think? Is it safe to keep? Thanks. You know, my dear 
late wife loved angels. She loved pictures of them. She uh, loved, uh, you know, little an angelic uh, mm -hmm. minuets and so forth. I, I think the idea is we don't worship angels, and I think we don't pray to angels, but the angels are a messenger of God, and they are, the Bible says they're sent to uh, look over the heirs of salvation. So, I, I mean, I tell you, I want, we used to go into a, a, a city, we would say, God, send the angels. Mm. Send the angels. Give them a mission to go out and, and, and give us freedom when we go into these cities. So, uh, I, I believe in angelic beings. Uh, we hope to have them surround us. The people years ago have, have seen angels uh, in, in the presence of uh, uh, we here on the, on the program. And I, but we don't worship them. We worship Jesus. And, uh, but he said, what, what is man? They have made him a little lower than the angels, but see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. So uh, right now, mankind is a little under the angels, but in Christ, we're going to be above the angels. But can she keep the music box? Oh, oh, keep, of course, keep the music box. Absolutely. That, you're not worshiping anything. It's a pretty box. Enjoy it. I would definitely keep it, too. <laughs> Lance from uh -oh, Waxahachie. I've actually been to Waxahachie, oh, Texas. Yeah, Waxahachie's right on the border oh, of Texas, man. yeah. Thank you for taking questions. I look forward to this every month. My question is, I know you're a big proponent of electric cars, but the power providers are already talking about rolling blackouts possibly this summer. So how can the power grid accept millions of cars being plugged in every evening when people come home from work? Aren't we going to have to build a whole lot more power plants? Uh, I don't think about more power plants to accommodate. We don't have any charging stations right now. I mean, electric cars only go so far. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, I just got a truck. I have a truck. I have a crew cab truck with a short bed. And the question is, do you want to get an electric? And the answer was no, because we cannot guarantee that you would have a charging station. Mm. Uh, I think uh, Volkswagen it was putting in charging stations all over Europe, but we don't have them now. And so electric cars are wonderful. They, they're, they're inexpensive. They're, they're so much more practical than internal combustion cars. But the thing that we don't have are charging stations. And so it's a nightmare to go from place to place to place because you can't find any place to charge them. And when they do charge, it may take all day long to get them charged. So that's the problem. And uh, uh, But I wouldn't worry about the grid. I, th I think the, there'll be plenty of capacity in the grid when the time comes, but right now, there's no, there's no demand whatsoever that would stress the grid. But the thing i am been warning people about, if we had a low level nuclear explosion over the Midwest, if we had a, a solar flare, it could knock out the electrical grid and that would cause incredible damage here in the country. And the, the cost of, of hardening our electrical system uh, is minuscule compared to the, da the damage. And yet I do not see anybody in Congress advocating like they should. There has been some initiatives toward it, but we need those big transformers. They're huge transformers that I think maybe uh, they're made in some, they may be made in China, we don't have them. But if we don't get those things, uh, it, will, it, will, the, it would be in calculable damage to our country. So that's much more important than worrying about electric cars and stressing the grid. The thing is, if we don't harden that electrical system, and I mean, this is a serious, serious matter, and we've been talking about it on this program forever and ever, but I wish Congress would wake up because they're spending, they talk about several trillion dollars that they talk about spending, and yet here a few billion would, would keep this country from being destroyed. And that they still, they, they're working on it, but it's so slow. Mm. Wow, thanks, okay. Pat. That was a good question, Lance. All right, Debbie uh, from Post Falls, Idaho has another question for Pat. Go ahead. I'd like to ask, what is the uh, best way to pray for our unsaved loved ones? Well, I, I think you should pray for the glory of God and say these people are rebels against God 
and uh, you love them, and I think you would remind the Lord of what he says, that it's not his will that any should perish, but all should come to the knowledge of the truth. And you could just say, Lord, I hold these people before you. I love them, and you love them, and we know that they're rebels against you, but please forgive them, and I know you're a gracious God, and then that's what you do to pray. And you, 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 you pray the Lord will do what needs to be done to bring those people to the Lord. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes people have to have, you know, they have to go through some trial before they come to the Lord. I mean, uh, but it's in, that's in God's hands. But you, you submit them into the Lord. That's how you pray for them. Amen. I always pray, don't let them leave until their names are written in your yeah. Lamb's Book of Life. <laughs> that's good. Amen. <laughs> yeah, right. that's good. Beverly from uh, Monk's Corner, South Carolina, has this question. My question has to do with Bitcoin. Do you think Bitcoin is a good investment? Thank you. Uh, the answer is I don't think it's a good investment at all. I think it's very risky. Uh, but at the same time, whoever's gotten in the early stages has made a fortune. The, the Bitcoin is just incredible. Hmm. But the, you, you were talking about energy. The, the Bitcoin mines take an enormous amount of energy uh, to create those things. But no, it's a lousy investment. I, didn't it just like tank well, recently? I thought it just well, it, it hadn't money. really tanked, but it was up to like forty thousand uh, dollars, whatever a coin. Uh, it's and they've got something called Ethereum, and they've got some other ones. But uh, I think it's a terrible investment. Okay, good word, good word. All right, Maria, Corpus Christi, Texas. Another question for Pat. Hello, brother Pat. I believed, really believed that my sister would be healed. I stood on the word. I declared it. I did everything that I've been taught to do, and she still went home to be with the Lord. She was a missionary and had so much love, life. I just wanted to see if you can explain why does God sometimes not answer after you've done everything that the word says to do. Uh, Maria, the Bible says, precious in the light, in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And there is a time to be with the Lord. And so maybe uh, your sister, uh, why would you keep her from the joy of the Lord? I mean, it's, it, heaven is a wonderful place. <laughs> and, and so if, it was, if, if she was sick, and maybe it was time to go. But um, again, we don't know what's in people's hearts. You pray for people, and some people enjoy their sickness. Some people have got unconfessed unconf resentment towards somebody else. We don't know what's in their heart. And you see, you're praying for them. But the big thing, remember, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And so the homecoming, the angels rejoice at one sinner that's saved. The angels also welcome those to into the family of God. They send the angels and carry them to Abraham's bosom. That's what the Bible says. So it isn't a bad thing to die. <laughs> you know, well, well I, I'm moving along. I'm 92. I'm trying to stay. I'm, I think I'm going to live to 120. But at the same time, being with the Lord is not a bad thing. <laughs> All right. And does that give you comfort about your own wife who just recently passed? Uh, absolutely, because I, I know she's with Jesus. But she suffered terribly, and uh, mm -hmm. she was 94, and uh, she was in agonizing pain. Wow. And, but uh, do I miss her? Of course I do. Is there a sadness? Yes. Uh, but she's with the Lord. And, you know, we had that service. We had beautiful music. I mean, beautiful music. Uh, and and I, I, I was talking to the Lord. I said, Lord, do you think she understood the music? And, and he said to me, the music she's having in, 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 hearing now in heaven is so much more beautiful than anything you had in that service. She's hearing beautiful things. The angels are singing. So, uh, you know, but do, do, you, do we miss those who departed? Of course we do. Is there a sadness? Yes. But we give them to the Lord, and then we have to get on with life. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. I know that helped a lot of people. Amen. Sharon from Kingman, Arizona, with this question for Pat. I'm asking, how do you hear God? I have been going to church for some time, and I keep praying, and I still don't hear God. How do you hear God? Uh, 
I think the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. I think we've got to keep our own mind out and just listen. Uh, but I, I also think of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, when you're baptized in the Spirit, which is a wonderful experience, uh, you begin to find out that the, there's a whole new dimension of life uh, where uh, the Bible says as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. And it also said you'll hear a voice in your ear saying, this is the way walk ye in it. So I do think God wants to speak to us. He wants to tell us. And all you've got to do is, quote, be still and know that I'm God. Just, you, just sit still for a while. Spend a little time in prayer and say, God, I need to hear from you. What do you want me to do? You know, I ask the Lord that every day. Lord, what do you want me to do? What would you like me to do today? What would you like? What would please you? And you say, I'm talking to him all the time. And you expect to hear his voice. That's the thing. Expect it, but like, be still and I also know. ask. And I bet you ask and you shall receive. I bet some days you're surprised at what he asks you to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, he, one time he said, start a TV station. Yeah. Well, you more, know? more recently, he's been telling me to start an elementary education. I've got an academy going right now to, to do it. Elementary. A, yeah, elementary, along with Regent, which is a oh, big. My. Plus CBN, plus the other things we've well, had to do. Breaking news. Breaking news right here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Michael from Smyrna, Tennessee has this question for Pat. First of all, I miss you. And second, I've got a question for you. The question is, should we worship God and take our day of rest on Saturday or Sunday? Thank you. Have a blessed day. You know, Jesus said the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the idea is to have one day of rest. Can you imagine what it would be like if you had to work seven days a week and then you had to turn around and work seven more days and you had to work seven more days? Uh, the, the Sabbath is made for man. So whether it's on Saturday, you know, you, you've got one group that worships God on Friday. You have another one who does it on Saturday. You've got another one who does it on Sunday. But the idea is you've got one day and what's happened in our society is we're, we're blessing seven days a week. It's 24-7, it's stores are open, TV's going, everything is blessing. And it's, you, we have more nervous breakdowns, we have all these problems because we have to have a day of rest. But I think the idea of, of uh, it's gotta be a particular day, I don't think that's the problem. The reason we have Sunday is because that's the day of the resurrection. Uh, the uh, Sabbath started for the Jewish thing on Friday night and it extended all day Saturday. I think the Muslims, if I'm not mistaken, have Friday. But I mean, the, the idea is a day of one day out of seven mm. unto the Lord is so important for all of us. Amen. We need it. I need more rest than other people, I think. <laughs> uh, view, this viewer from Corpus Christi, Texas. Hey, Pat, I had a question. And Peter talks about that Jesus preached to the people in hell. What exactly is that referring to? Who is he preaching to in hell? Um, I think there are those who have, over the years, have not received the fullness of salvation. That's a one-time reference. We don't have a lot of elucidation about that in the Bible. But the idea is he, he, there was a time that Jesus... But between his death and his resurrection, and Peter is saying he descended into heaven, and he preached to those who were being held captive there. So are these the Old Testament saints, those who hadn't had the fullness of salvation, and suddenly he gives them the, the knowledge of salvation through him, which is what I suppose it would be. I guess that's it, but we don't have enough description in the Bible to, to say for certain, but that's what my, my informed guess would be. Mary from Rigby, oh, uh, Idaho, with this very interesting question for Pat. My question to Pat is, if the Jewish people are true to their religion and to God, why don't they do the animal sacrifices like they used to? Because that was their rule and law, and they don't believe that Jesus paid the price. Thank you. God bless. Uh, well, you, you know, I really think uh, if you put it to uh, one of our Jewish friends, that's something they can't answer. Uh, you know, if you really are true to the, what is in the Bible, uh, you will 
have animal sacrifice because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So if, the, the, if Jesus isn't the sacrifice, who is? And I, I think you've raised a good point, uh, but uh, the thing that I am so thrilled about is how many are so-called Messianic believers. Mm -hmm. There's a real move of God. And the Apostle Paul said when, when they come back, he said, you know, we Gentiles are like we've been grafted into to Israel. And um, when they come back to the Lord, and they will be, he said, all Israel is going to be saved. There's going to be, there is already starting, and there will continue to be a tremendous move of God among the Jewish people. And they are coming back to the faith of, their, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And to me, it's a great move of what's happening but I know so many um, what's called, called Messianic believers. They are on fire for God, and it's just beautiful to see what happens when the children of Abraham, the, 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 the real children of Israel, uh, come to the Lord. I mean, they are on fire for God, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see. It's your voicemails, and we've got Pat here in the flesh to answer your questions. We're going to start with this viewer from New Orleans. Hi, Pat. My question is about the Holy Spirit. I thought I heard someone say we're not supposed to worship him, but I love him and I tell him all the time. Can you please explain how we're to approach him and if we can actually ask him to pray through us in our spiritual language if we don't know how to pray? Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. You know, you pray to the Father uh, in the name of the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the idea. And I've just written a book, by the way, on the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit in you. I will be given, I think, as a premium uh, for CBN. Uh, but, the, the, you know, we say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. And I, I, I think we can speak to the Holy Spirit and ask for his help. The Bible says he, he, uh, we, we, he, he, makes intercession for the saints with groanings which cannot be uttered. And I, I do believe that uh, there's nothing wrong with, with asking for the Holy Spirit. We, we sing a song, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. And so I, I, I honor the Holy Spirit and I thank God for his power. And I would ask, I would ask the Lord, I want more of you, but I also need to be, have the power of the Holy Spirit. But I, I'm, as a matter of fact, I have a region what's called the Chancellor, Chancellor's Forum. And on Monday, I'm going to be talking about to the uh, Divinity School, and I will be talking about the Holy Spirit and how he, he functions in people's lives. And, and tell me the name of your book again on the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's, it's the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Okay, and you can get that wherever books are sold. Well, yeah, but I think we were giving it as a premium at CBN, I believe. 1-800-700-7000. Be... Call and find out. <laughs> <laughs> the power Whatever. of the Holy Spirit in you. It's very power good. power of the Holy Spirit in you. All right. Amen. All right, David from Hot Springs, Arizona has this. I'd like to know, is everybody given the same portion of faith, or is it given on an individual basis differently. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. You know, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And uh, uh, faith is one of the, uh, the enablements of the Holy Spirit. That there is, is uh, a supernatural faith that comes and there's just normal faith in God. But uh, I do think the more we exercise the power of God, our faith grows. If we see him do one kind of miracle, then it, our faith grows to the next kind of miracle. Well, I saw him heal a little child, so I think he can heal the little child's mother. I mean, it's that kind of thing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So if we read the Word, faith will begin to rise in our heart. So it's not like God gives you some and not gives you something else. But I think the more we exercise what faith we have, faith will grow. Amen. All right. Andrea from Alberta, Canada has this question for Pat. I would like to know your opinion on tattoos. 
It says in the Bible that we are not to mark our bodies. However, tattoos are so popular now and equally among Christians, where a lot of Christians use this as their testimony and to mark their love for Jesus. I'd like to know where you stand on this, as I can't seem to find any answers. Thank you so much for all you do. This is a show on TV, which is called LA Inc. I think it's an abomination of the things that people do to their bodies. The Bible says you're not supposed to do that. It's heathen. It's a heathen mark. These tattoos are what the heathen did. And there's no way some Christian can, quote, use that as a testimony. That's nonsense. I think they are wrong, period. And uh, uh, I just don't think you should do it. But um, I've Young seen, people, absolutely oh man, they, they're love getting it. tattooed all the time and they're ruining themselves. And then a lot of them would like to get rid of it. And it takes a huge amount of, of scraping to get that stuff out because it's, it's into your skin. And uh, yeah. just, I mean, it used to be people would get like, you know, a little one yeah. here or there. Um, and, but now they get what they call sleeves. But then they oh, don't always like oh, your whole it, it, It's arm. outrageous. And, and they, they compare, and some people are covered all over with those things. It is pagan, period, not Christian. There is no way a tattoo will be a testimony. Uh, you know, it just isn't. So you ask me a question, that's the answer it's from me. All right, there it is. Okay, Arlene, Wichita, Kansas has another question for Pat. Good morning, Pat. Some people think that people who have died in Christ can oversee their loved ones on earth. Is this referring to that? Is that true or not? Can you explain that to me and clarify everything? Thank you so much again, and God bless. Uh, yeah, there's, I don't believe that God allows the departed to look down and know what we're doing. I know that uh, this, uh, that story that Jesus told about the rich man and, and, the, and the beggar, and the beggar says, uh, you know, I've got you know, family on earth. Could you please? And 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 Moses. Well, they've got Moses and the prophets. And if they won't believe, they won't believe if somebody rises from the dead. I, I don't believe that our loved ones can look in on seeing what we're doing here on earth. But uh, there's nothing in the Bible that indicates one way or the other. But I, I have no scriptural authorization to say that it does. Okay, amen. Rod from Pensacola, Florida has another question for Pat. My question is, what is your opinion on the Messianic Jewish movement in this country and around the world? Is it a biblical prophecy that, that Jewish people come to faith in, these, um, in, in the Messianic Jewish movement? Thank you. Thanks, Rod. I, I think I dealt with that in the previous question, but I do think the Bible says all Israel will be saved. All Israel. That's what Paul said. And he said, it will be like, like light from the dead. When they come to the Lord, that will be a, a beginning of one of the greatest revivals the world has ever known. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 when they come to the Lord, but they may not come until there's a time of intense pressure. And we, we see in Ezekiel 38, uh, that this is a, uh, an invasion of Israel and and they're under pressure, and God himself comes in to, to, to deliver them. And I, I do believe that, that Israel, the nation, is under great stress and pressure. But in terms of messianic, I do see a move of God, and they are beautiful, beautiful Christians. And I do not believe in this so-called replacement theology that the church replaced Israel. Israel is Israel. The church is church. And uh, the two go on together, and uh, that's the way it's going to be. But there's some who teach what's called replacement theology, that the church replaced Israel, and that all the references of Israel in the Bible should be read church instead of Israel. No way, no how, in my opinion. Last round of this special edition of the 700 Club, your voicemail questions, Pat's honest answers. We're going to start with this viewer from Houston, Texas. Go ahead. I am wondering if dogs will go to heaven and our animals that the Lord created. I'm having problems finding it in the Bible. God bless you. Have a blessed day. If you read Ecclesiastes, it says the soul of man goes up where the soul of the beast goes into the ground. Uh, I, I can say for certain 
that there are going to be horses in heaven because the Lord will be riding on our charges when he comes back. But as far as dogs, I've had every kind of dog you could imagine. I mean, you name it, and I've had one of them or more than one of them, and I've trained dogs, and I enjoy dogs, but I don't see anything in the Bible that indicates they're going to be in heaven. We get this question every time. I know we do. People and really want I, their pets to be know, with them. But it's crazy the amount of money people are spending on these animals. You know, they even have grief counseling now. If your dog dies, they'll, they, you can pay money to get grief counseling. Wow. And people have identified with these animals. They're like their children, mm -hmm. and they're so important to them. But um, we have had every kind of, we've had every kind of poodle, little poodles, big poodles, standard poodles. I've had borzois. I've had uh, uh, pointers and setters and you name it, and uh, I've trained dogs, and we've we've had a lot of dogs, and uh, I'm all for them. They're very wonderful uh, beings, and they're very responsive to you. But uh, I see nothing about them being in heaven. All right, that's it hurts, but that's what the Bible <laughs> says. <laughs> Judy from Bronson, Florida, has this question for Pat. My question is, how much of bad things that a Christian experiences? is part of sowing and reaping. Thank you. Uh, Judy, I, I don't know. In the Apostle Paul said, those that live godly in, in Christ will suffer. The word in Greek is thalipsis, and it means pressure. We will have pressure as we live for the Lord. There will be pressure, and there will be a ridicule, and there will be all kinds of things. The devil doesn't like Christians, and he will send uh, attacks against us, and we need to live beyond it. We need to eat good by the fruit of our lips. We need to, to declare when we are under uh, stress. But there's one thing I want to say. Some of you may be having Satan, satanic attack. I bind you, Satan, and the forces of evil. Say it and, and speak it. But declare with your mouth, a man shall eat good by the fruit of his lips. But, you know, you, you don't say, well, I've got to take suffering. Well, yes, of course, there will be suffering and there will be trouble. But I could declare this is the day the Lord hath made. God loves me. I am his child. And we declare the good things, not the bad things. Good right. word. Good word. Susan from Auburn, California, has this question for Pat. Hi, Pat. My question is, will there be communion in heaven? Thank you. You know, the Lord said, uh, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new in the kingdom of heaven. So uh, apparently, I said, this is my uh, the blood of the testimony. So the Lord indicated apparently in heaven there'll be something like this. One last question. Okay, Michelle from Sagartes, New York. When the trumpet sounds and the dead will rise, my question is, what happens to those that have been cremated? Well, I think those ashes will come together, but I, I think cremation is wrong. Cremation used to be what they did for the enemies, and they, I, they gave a, a, a proper burial uh, to honor the dead. And But I, I think the spirit is what's alive, not, not the bodies. And the spirits are with the Lord, and the Lord will give the spirit a new body in heaven. Well, thanks so much for those questions, and I'll leave you with these words from Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So for Wendy and all of us, thanks so much for being with us. I'd love to be back with you, and we'll see you in about another month for another question and answer program.